Okay, so good morning. Uh, welcome to this first panel, which will address new challenges for the separation of powers. I think we can call this the keynote panel of uh, the day. It uh, includes panelists from three different continents uh, and includes in particular also the two co-organizers uh, uh, of the event, right? And our host, uh, David Bilchit. So another reason uh, to call it uh, the keynote panel. I will not uh, waste your time by giving my own <laughs> opinions on the topic. Uh, let's start straight away uh, with the paper by uh, David Bilchitz, which is called Towards a Defensible Relationship Between the Content of Socioeconomic Rights and the Separation of Powers, Conflation or Separation. David, you have 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Eva. So, um, preparing this paper, the question that really struck me and that I wanted to address was what is the relationship between the separation of powers and the content of socioeconomic rights? Separation of powers, I argue, have been allowed to play a central role in determining the very content of these fundamental rights. And the key focus of this paper is the attempt to capture the relationship between separation of powers concerns and determining the content of fundamental rights. And I'm very interested in the conceptual relationship of what people have to say about that. So first I'm going to illustrate the background to this question and practically how the issue arises in the case law of the South African Constitutional Court. Secondly, I'm, I'm going to argue against the conflation of these two sets of concerns, conceptually and normatively. Thirdly, I'm going to attempt to capture the relationship between these two sets of concerns through examining a distinction between rights-orientated perspectives and obligations-orientated perspectives. Fourthly, some points relating to why the nature and substance of rights supports a role for the judiciary in determining that content. And my key argument is going to be that the substantive understanding of rights must condition the application of the separation of powers doctrine rather than the other way round. So to start off with, um, how does this problem arise? Right, well, um, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> in relation to um, objections, um, in basically a little bit of overview, in relation to inclusion of socioeconomic rights in constitutions, there were a number of objections to why they should not be included and justiciable socioeconomic rights should not be included. Those objections have really transformed into objections about how judges should exercise their powers in constitutions which have recognised these rights. And the objections are quite familiar, so I'm not going to go for them, through them in detail to many people here, but the first objection is a legitimacy objection. Judges should not prescribe economic policy or budgetary allocations to democratically elected uh, polity. And that's often linked with claims about polycentricity, where there are large budgetary consequences uh, that affect multiple areas. Uh, judges should not get involved in that. And also questions of competence, right? The competence objection. Judges lack expertise in economic and policy questions and are ill-suited to issue judgments in relation to them. Now, those set of objections are often linked, although they kind of, there's a separate conceptual element, to content-based objections to socioeconomic rights. The content-based objections basically argue that these rights are indeterminate. They're inherently vague, and they do not lend themselves to judicial enforcement. Uh, now, how in some senses is that content-based argument linked to institutional concern? <coughs> well, the argument is that to render these rights more determinate, would involve making the duties or obligations they impose more explicit. That would in turn usurp the powers of democratically elected branches of government, essentially to make decisions in that area, and it would go beyond the realm of judicial competences. And as I said, initially these objections were lodged against very inclusion, the very judicial review of socioeconomic rights at all, um, and more recently they have focused on how judges should exercise their power. And the argument has been judges should exercise their power in a restrained, deferential manner that does not remove their indeterminacy. That will ultimately enable some flexibility to avoid cases where institutional concerns caution the judiciary from interfering. So how does that relate to the work of the South African Constitutional Court? Well, institutional concerns have very much influenced the judges in South Africa when providing content to these rights. Um, 
This may be true elsewhere, and I would be actually also interested to hear uh, my hunch and from my reading of comparative law, this is true in other parts of the world, true. But uh, I, I would be interested to hear from some of the experts here about that. But the South African Constitutional Court's approach to adjudicating socioeconomic rights has been the following. Basically, the court has said that if the government has not adopted a program in relation to these rights, like rights to housing or healthcare or food, it will order the government to adopt a program. And then in relation to that program, it will be prepared to assess the reasonableness of the program. The court has, however, refused to engage with the very content of the rights themselves. It said it's not its role to lay out what the rights themselves mean. And this is expressed most clearly in the recent Mazibuko case, not so recent, uh, about six years ago. And it dealt with a claim by residents of a poor part of Johannesburg, some people got to see yesterday, some of the conditions people live in, that the amount of free basic water provided by the city was insufficient to meet their needs. So the city provides a certain amount of water per month, which people get for free, and thereafter you have to pay, about six kiloliters of water per household. Right? And there was a challenge about whether it should be a household or individuals. So there were a number of things that were, 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 were argued. But the residents of this part of Johannesburg argued their reasons were rooted in the fact that, that in urban areas, they had to use flush toilets, which required more water, essentially. And also many of the residents of this area were suffering from HIV, which meant people had very severe health needs and therefore needed more water, uh, often needed to go to the bathroom more often, and therefore they, they needed a higher basic uh, uh, free basic water allowance. Now, at the uh, High Court and Supreme Court of Appeal levels, uh, the courts ruled that they had their, their claims should succeed. And uh, in the uh, uh, High Court, the judge said that people were to get 50 litres a day. And in the Supreme Court of Appeal, they accepted different expert evidence as to what was required. People needed to get 42 litres a day. At the Constitutional Court level, O'Regan Jay refused to provide any determination as to the amount of water individuals were entitled to in terms of their right to have access to sufficient water. That's the right in the Constitution. Section 27.1b of the Constitution. And she said the following, key saying part. Ordinarily, she says, it is institutionally inappropriate for a court to determine precisely what the achievement of any particular social and economic right entails and what steps the government should take to ensure the progressive realisation of this right. This is a matter in the first place for the legislature and executive, the institutions of government best place to investigate social conditions in light of available budgets and to determine what targets are achievable in relation to socioeconomic rights. And you can read the rest of uh, the quote yourself. So she also went to, on to say that the rights acquire content through legislative and executive measures taken to realise them. And the court's role will be to evaluate the reasonableness of those measures, whatever that exactly means. Okay? So, in Mali Buko case in South African law is seen as a high watermark of deference on the part of the Constitutional Court. The Court basically avoids giving substantive content to these rights, and its reason for doing so is really drawn from a vision of the separation of powers, right? As you saw, it's institutionally inappropriate for the Court to perform this task. Is this link justifiable? Well, in approaching this question, I'm going to seek to understand, firstly, the normative foundations of each rights and separation of powers. I'm going to contend that the conflation is unjustifiable conceptually and also undesirable. Okay? So why do I argue this? Well, starting point, these points will be quite familiar to people working with rights. What are the basic underpinnings of rights? Rights are connected basically to the idea of some kind of dignity of individuals who have worth, which requires some form of respectful treatment. Such respectful treatment requires recognizing a range of entitlements that protect basically individuals' freedom to pursue their life goals and to have the general resources necessary to do so. Yes, I know I'm covering wide ranges of constitutional theory, but nevertheless, for our purposes, I think this broadly captures what many people will understand by fundamental rights. What are key features of rights-based reasoning? Well, first, the focus of fundamental rights is on the beneficiaries of the rights and ensuring they have the freedom and resources guaranteed to them. Secondly, rights discourse leaves open the agents who are responsible for realizing these guarantees. This basically provides an inbuilt flexibility concerning these agents. Rights were never designed solely against the state, which is quite an important issue. Okay? And finally, rights are concerned to protect fundamental interests of individuals and require a range of actions to realize them, both negative obligations of non-interference 
and positive obligations of concrete action to realize them. Let's go briefly to the underpinnings of the separation of powers doctrine. Okay, and again, I have to summarize very, very radically, and hopefully not too badly distort. And as we heard, the worry of the separation doctrine, the power doctrine, is very much about the concentration of too much state power in one individual institution, which often leads to abuse. So the idea of the fix is to diffuse that power amongst various branches of government, each with its own functions. Now, because it's impossible to totally separate out these powers, some, we know there will be some overlap. There are also checks and balances kind of built into that system. <coughs> and ultimately, also, some more recent work talks about uh, separation of powers from the perspective of efficiency, that somehow a separation of powers can contribute to more efficient government by focusing on those who have particular expertise in particular areas and can therefore improve governance in that realm. So if we have a look at these two different ideas, right, fundamental rights essentially concern what individuals may legitimately claim at a minimum within a political community, what I call the what question. Separation of powers, on the other hand, concerns who within a state is best placed to perform particular tasks, what I call the who question. And it's difficult to see how the who question can determine the what question. Different questions must be answered separately. The entitlements of individuals rest upon their fundamental interests that require protections and do not depend at all on the appropriate agents to realize these entitlements. To use the who question to determine what is guaranteed conflates two distinct issues and undermines a sense of what rights, in fact, protect. In fact, right, the relationship, in, I argue, should be the other way around. If rights are the basic conditions of substantive justice guaranteed in a constitution, they should be guiding principles which underpin the operation of the separation of powers. What must be provided is necessary to understand in order to decide who is best placed to give effect to rights. This was, I argue, actually even the understanding in the traditional conception of the separation of powers, which was seen as a means to realize the substantive goals of preventing abuse of power why? Ultimately, to protect the liberty of individuals, right? Conflation, I argue, is also undesirable because it leads to the weakening of rights. The content of rights become detached from the fundamental interests of individuals and institutional factors become primary in the reasoning of courts and can overshadow the focus on individuals. So in the Mazibuko case, the Constitutional Court does not fo focus at all, doesn't even engage with it, in the judgment about the lack of flush toilets or the HIV AIDS suffered by the people in the community. The focus is rather on the reasonableness of the actions of the government. And this ultimately highlights what I, as I was working on this paper, I was discussing with people how this sometimes happens. You suddenly kind of come up with, think about different links. And this seemed to me to highlight a deeper flaw in the reasoning underlying this conflation to which I now turn. Rights ultimately give rise, as we know, to correlative duties. But that fact does not imply, I argue, a conceptual equivalence between the two. Rights are beneficiary focused, ultimately focused on what a person is entitled to. Duties are agent focused. What must be done by a particular agent and which agent is responsible? Constitutional systems place rights as primary um, and this is uh, 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 really, one needs to understand, I argue, these entitlements which help specify the obligations that people have, uh, other agents have, and the allocation of those obligations themselves. The South African Constitutional Court, I, say, uh, I argue, spends little time analysing rights and interests protected by them, but moves immediately to focus on the obligations of the state. So the flawed approach in Mazibuko, I argue, can be traced to the following statement. The court says, it will be helpful to start by considering the relationship between these two sections of the Constitution. In section 27.1, the Constitution creates a right of access to sufficient water. As with all rights, to understand the nature of the right, we need to understand the nature of the obligations imposed by it. What obligations does it impose and upon whom? What the court does here is it places duties at the center of rights reasoning. And this undermines the focus of the constitution on rights. The concerns relating to uh, what, what it does by placing this, it places concerns relating to the appropriate agents for fulfilling rights as primary 
But it's inappropriate, I argue, to bring questions of appropriate agents into the very construction of the rights themselves. So what are the implications of these conceptual points? We obviously know agents matter as well. So I'm not saying that we should not consider that question. So the starting point, I argue, must be with the construction of rights when engaging with fundamental rights and separate that from institutional <coughs> considerations. This allows a clear understanding of what the Constitution is meant to guarantee and the interest and level of satisfaction that is guaranteed. It provides a clear understanding of the weight and significance of the interests guaranteed. This is necessary, I argue, for any evaluation of the justifiability of the reasons for not realizing these rights as well, or only doing so partially. And I accept there will be reasons for not realizing rights, okay? But in order to evaluate those reasons, to order to evaluate the obligations and why that obligations perspective might limit rights, you need to have some idea of what the rights are, what the appropriate weight is in any balancing exercise. And that, I argue, is an analytical precondition to a proper evaluation of governmental reasons for not realizing them. The next stage, after we've constructed the rights, separate from institutional considerations, is of course to consider the obligations for agents. That allows rooms for, room for justification for the attenuation of these obligations. A number of issues arise about scarcity of resources, which become important here. And also at this point, issues around the agents and which agents will become important in realizing the rights. This is where separation of powers concerns may come in. If the failure relates to legislation, then the legislature must be ordered to perform its task. And the same with the executive, right? We're going to have to have a look at who is best placed in this area to realize their obligations. Courts will need to here consider issues relating to expertise, effectiveness, and a number of issues relating to democratic considerations. So, separation of powers considerations may provide court reasons for courts not to order exactly what must be done in particular circumstances. I accept that. But it provides no reason for all branches of government to avoid giving content to rights and how this influenced their decision making. Ultimately, even if you say that another branch of government is required to do something, it needs to provide some understanding of what the content of those rights is. Separation of what and who questions is as important for other branches of government as it is for courts. The fact that a court defers does not mean another branch can decide as it likes. It must provide reasons as to why uh, the construal of its obligations is justifiable in light of what the rights in fact guarantee to individuals. Again, you have to have an understanding of rights in order properly to understand the obligations and the justification for the attenuation of those obligations. So back to the reasonableness of approach of the court. It seems to focus very much on assessing the justifiability of obligations assumed by other branches of government. And of course, at that level, it's important. But its problem lies in the lack of engagement with the rights-based considerations and lack of coherence that follows as there is very little basis upon which to evaluate the reasoning of the other branches. Grappling with content, I argue, becomes primary on the approach I advocate and requires any justification for failing to realize rights to do so. So, a quick example. Juana is unable to feed herself and approaches court for violation of rights to sufficient food. Courts must determine the interests of Juana protected by the rights first. If she's starving, it's hard to see how the right cannot be infringed without making the right meaningless. We might also argue she lacks adequate food, and there the courts would have to specify certain general standards as to the level of provision guaranteed by the right, which will determine whether it's infringed or not. Okay? And we can discuss the level of specificity, because that's an interesting issue, but I don't have time to go into that. The second step will be then for the court to think about what standards require various agents. There will be correlative obligations to meet the standards required by the rights. Now, there may be reasons why it may not be able to rea be realized immediately. Scarcity, distribution, no disruption of efficiency, the responsibility of Juana herself. That will help determine what exactly must be done. But it also will be crucial to determine at that point who must do it. There will have to be an allocation of obligations, which is crucial for the effective defense of Juana's rights. And that will need to take account of the competence, capacity, and democratic appropriateness of the various bodies, both horizontally and also in federal systems uh, vertically as well. So the last point I wanted to uh, discuss briefly relates to the judiciary. The discussion has assumed that the judiciary itself should provide content to rights. 
And there's a profound challenge as to what the role of the judiciary should be in the interpretation of rights. Rights involve matters in which people disagree, okay? And the judiciary should thus arguably utilize its powers only in circumstances which are uncontroversial. That's the, the, count, the challenge. Or where there has already been a determination of content by the legislature or the executive. Well, the objection ultimately, <coughs> there are three responses I'm going to make, and very briefly because I'm running out of time. The first is, this provides no grounds to conflate content and separation of powers concerns. As I've argued before, whichever institution is supposed to provide content has to provide some content to the rights. I mean, we could well argue that if other branches fail to do so, the judiciary can order them to do so. The second important point relates to the judiciary and what and who questions itself. Okay? And it's very, um, now I'm, I'm starting in constitutional systems which have already given a task for the judiciary to provide content to, to rights. In such systems, if the judiciary, in systems which already provide for judicial review, and in such a system, it has to provide an understanding of its role. And understanding its role requires having a conception of the nature and substance of the rights. Then the judiciary must, of necessity, engage in some determination of the nature and the substance of the rights. Okay? So understanding of content is ultimately necessary for an understanding of how it should exercise its adjudicatory powers. And the last point, which I really don't have time to develop, relates to the question of the fact that rights have a higher status in the constitutional system, and as such, it cannot just be that the ordinary, uh, the, the ordinary uh, structures are sufficient to give them that status. One has to have certain extraordinary procedures. Um, in some cases, that might exist within the legislature and executive, but in, in situations where the judiciary is provided with that structure, then there's no good reason why, it, by understanding the nature of rights in the system, the what of rights in the system, this will give good reason for the judiciary, which has been given that task, to perform the task of <laughs> giving content to these rights. So in conclusion, fundamental rights are core substantive normative considerations underlying constitutional de democracy. They are necessary to consider the design of institutions to realize this core. Institutional design, I argue, has its own logic, and there are a range of reasons why some institutions succeed and others fail that are separate from rights-based reasoning. What is also clear is that institutional considerations are at the service of ensuring the realization of fundamental rights. If so, we cannot collapse content and institutional considerations. The content of rights must be determined independently, and this applies to all branches. There are also reasons, very briefly I mentioned, for the judiciary to have a special role. Ultimately, I contend the goal of institutional structures must be to ensure that the fundamental rights of individuals are realized. And to do so, we must avoid fetishizing those structures and ensure that rights are accorded the attention they deserve. Thank you very much. The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.